All right, let's stay with this uh, particular issue and speak to some of the activists. Of course, remember, there are reports already uh, that started emerging as early as last week of how there appears to be some crackdowns on protests uh, as well as some of the activists. Let's speak to the Green Connection Strategic Leads, um, Liz McDade, as well as the Climate and Climate Justice Campaigner and uh, SA Climate Justice Coalition Secretary, Dr. Alice Lenferner. Thank you so much to you both for your time i'll begin with you uh liz i'm not sure if you're able to even maybe get in touch with some of the people on the ground because we're seeing reports that are suggesting apparent crackdowns some arrests taking place points where people are being checked and their phones are being checked what are you hearing on the ground so i can just say that we haven't received any reports of that at this moment of course, everything unfolds, and what we have seen today is some of the world leaders making promises and speeches. Um, and I understand that on the ground, people have uh, T-shirts because there isn't any real protest allowed. So uh, our understanding is that the, the cri critical problem is it's like a party mm. and a nice little holiday fiesta atmosphere instead of being a really serious um, atmosphere with a, with a global climate crisis, which we need to address. So and that's our feedback. Yeah, and Dr. Alex, I mean, listening to what Liz is saying, I mean, activists do have a role to play because even the UN Secretary General talking about the importance of everyone's voice being heard mm. when it comes to these talks and no one left behind. What do, you know, the, these apparent crackdowns that we're hearing about, what do they do um, when it comes to the work of, 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 of you know, activists and how they then take part in some of these contentious issues that are meant to be discussed behind closed doors? Yeah, I think it's a really important issue. I and mean, we've seen many reports from Egypt of human rights activists and climate justice activists having their political rights repressed. And there's a lot of importance of standing in solidarity with those that have been jailed. Um, and it's not just an issue of Egypt. I think it's an issue globally where mm. those standing up for environmental justice often face violent repression, assassination, um, imprisonment for what they're doing. And I think we see that even in South Africa. And even if it's not as severe as brutal repression, what we often see is that these negotiations are taking place behind closed doors. So even with South Africa's big climate finance deal, you know, a lot of that was done in private with the you know, big banks, the big global banks like the World Bank. And so there wasn't meaningful democratic engagement. And so that's why actually we as the Climate Justice Coalition on Saturday will be holding a big march in Schwane going to the Office of the Presidency, the Department of Public Enterprise and National Treasury, demanding that we have a meaningful seat at the table when it comes to these sorts mm. of discussions. And, and, and Dr. Alex, I'm going to say with you before I move on to, you know, Liz on this one, because part of what one sees when we're reading some of, you know, the rules on the website and, and, and in part they say that anyone wanting to organize a protest um, will need to be registered for the public part of the conference. But I wonder, the, this registration, though, doesn't it give rise to concerns around surveillance when it comes to activists? Yeah, I mean, I think there are issues there. You know, the last COP I went to was 10 years ago when it was in Durban, South Africa. But Egypt is a very different kind of state than South Africa. The, the freedom of speech is a lot more limited and curtailed there. And I think there has been concerns from activists about what that means uh, in terms of their ability to robustly exercise their freedom of speech, particularly if they're going to be you know, registered on an Egyptian government registry. Um, and I think this worry comes again next year because the COP will be hosted by United Arab Emirates and they're not exactly a, a bastion of, of free speech and, and political freedom. Um, so I think we do need to think carefully about how do we meaningfully include people's voices, particularly those that are in more vulnerable and marginalized mm. positions who are often also on the front lines of climate impacts or of fossil fuel industry projects that mm. harm them. And so the, these issues of human rights are central to climate justice. Mm. 
and 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 Liz, listening to um, the UN Secretary General saying that uh, while there's still a lot more that needs to be done, but he believes that um, there's there's progress that is being made as far as the just energy transition is concerned. Are you in agreement with that statement? No, I, I, I'm a bit cynical about these cops. And I, I think just to build on what Alex has said is, why is it that the UN continues to sort of acknowledge countries with a bad human rights uh, record? Why are we not only holding the cops in countries that are prepared to allow civil society to have their voice? And I think this is very critical because whose opinions count? And therefore, whether we move forward on a just any tra transition, it can't be left to the suits in the back room. Mm. It's got to be those who are affected which come to the party. That applies down to the local level as well. When we find that the investment plan for the just energy transition, which has gone to COP on behalf of the South African government, has not yet been consulted with the people of South Africa. That's, for me, the wrong way around. We should have first had a, a, a consultative process to decide what is our energy plan, what is our economic plan, how do we ensure just any transition. And we were all on the same page. That's when the president should pick up that plan and head to the international arena to ask for the rest of the developed world, which gained from the climate crisis in the past, which has led us to this point, they must now come to the table to put up the money, not loans that we have to pay back, mm. but money on the table that we can use to transition. I suppose then, Liz, you wouldn't even be, uh, you know, convinced by the call then uh, that there should be a climate solidarity pact for countries to make you know, agreements to, to reduce emissions, particularly, especially when one looks at what we've seen in the past, some of these non-binding agreements, some saying that they're just falling by the wayside. Let's give you a practical example. We, we hear President Macron talking about the need to, to, to not mine the ocean floor. And yet right now in South Africa, the French company Total is trying to get permission to drill the oceans or look for offshore oil and gas, more fossil fuels into the atmosphere, and by doing so, risk the livelihoods of people most vulnerable at the coast. So, so we want we want to hear real promises followed by real action, and and really, not to make it a pun, but not a lot of hot air. We've had enough of that. Mm, and and Dr. Alex, you know, Liz talks about something that is is, is very concerning and you touched on it um, a little earlier on, which is, you know, we see some of these activists around some of these environmental issues and we've seen some deaths even in some of these communities, um, you know, and, and, and it's really quite a concerning situation. But would you say that it's receiving as speedily of attention as it's possible, as it needs? Because ultimately, some of these communities are trying to make their voices heard, but they're losing the people that are at the forefront of some of these fights. Yeah. I think that's a vitally important issue. And the South African government, unfortunately, is complicit in some of this. For example, Minister Montashe and the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy often are trying to go around communities that are resisting these harmful, extractive, polluting oil, coal and gas projects. Um, and we saw that when it came to the Shell case where, you know, the, the court said that the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy under Minister Montashe was so blatantly biased in favor of these polluting corporations that communities weren't even expected to go through that department um, as a means of due process because their bias was so blatant. And I think this is the problem where we have governments that are captured by the polluting corporations that are driving us into climate crisis and governments that work with those polluting corporations to override the will of the people who are trying to fight back against them. And then when the communities try to fight back, will often you know, collaborate with vicious repressive forces 
forces that have led to activists being assassinated here in South Africa. Mm. Um, and so I think it's very clear that, I mean, the science of climate change is telling us we need to move away from coal, oil and gas rapidly. And yet the South African government, you know, it's going onto this international stage claiming they want money for clean energy, while at the same time trying to, you know, ramp up coal, oil and gas extraction. Minister Montashi is talking about new coal, new gas, new oil. And so we have a government that's you got this, you know, bipolar message that is going in different directions. And meanwhile, those that are pushing for meaningful climate justice on the ground are being repressed by that same government in partnership with these big polluting corporations. Liz, um, I wonder then, in the context of that, are you hopeful that we'll see uh, very strong action here, given the fact that we're already seeing some reports suggesting that some of the culprits when it comes to the emissions may not even be present, or some of them may only come next week? Yeah, I, I think we need to look at who's coming to the party and what are they putting on the table. Because we, we see, I mean, I think it's really good that loss and damage is now on the table, but it's only on the table. So what, two weeks later, are we going to get anything real or is it just going to be discussions about discussions about discussions? You know, maybe we need to put all these people in a tent in the middle of the desert instead of in the air conditioned hotels. And maybe we'll get uh, real answers. Um, let them live like the people that are really struggling with climate change for a while. And maybe we would get some strong action then. And for you, Dr. Alex, are you expecting some groundbreaking decisions? I mean, the issue of climate justice, the issue of financing is a huge one. And mm. a lot of activists are waiting to see if there'll be any movement of the needle, sort of, uh, when it comes to some of those issues. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the difficulty with these cops is that they often give us rather incremental progress, right? And what the science of climate change is telling us is that if we want to keep within the Paris Climate Agreement's goal of keeping warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, that what we need is not incremental change, but transformative change. Um, and that means, you know, moving away from fossil fuels at a rapid pace to renewable energy. Um, and the government's typically across the globe are not moving at the at the needed pace and i think south africa here is guilty too we are one of the biggest climate polluters um, of course we are a very unequal country so those that have benefited the most from pollution tend to be you know the wealthy individuals and corporation who gained their wealth in the sort of coal-fired powers of, of apartheid and the legacies that came from that so i think we in south africa maybe also need to think how do we maybe put a tax on those that are wealthy and that have benefited from pollution to fund a much more transformative climate justice agenda that moves at the speed that's required. Because otherwise, we are seeing that climate target slipping out of reach rapidly, and we are moving to a world that will be devastated by climate change, and that will reverse progress on development, will reverse progress on so much that is needed for a stable society. So we need to act with much more urgency than these cops tend to deliver. Mm. And I think it comes back to us at home in across the world to not wait for these UN climate spaces, but to build radical movements that can hold our government's feet to the fire and demand the transformative change that's needed. And so that's also why we march this Saturday, because we're not waiting for these cops. We're not waiting for these UN spaces. We want to shake our government by the feet and get them moving um, because otherwise we'll lose this last window of opportunity to avert some of the worst impacts of climate change. All right. Thank you so much to you both for your time. And I do hope we get to speak again at the end of this to see if uh, some of your expectations were met or if, in fact, it was just the talk shop, as some say, it may just be with very little implementation. But let me thank you both for your time. That was uh, the Green Connection strategic lead, Liz McDade, and uh, climate justice campaigner and South Africa's uh, climate justice coalition secretary, Dr. Alex Lindferner.